The impact of Advent is massive. In this sermon series, we'll hear some of the voices of Advent and see that when mercy draws near, it gives birth to humble participation, compassionate integrity, and worshipful proclamation. And these are only a few of the countless voices that testify of how the Advent season redeems and renews. So may our voices also be among them during this season. This content comes from Mercy Village Church in Barbersville, West Virginia, and you can learn more at www.mercyvillage.church. All right. So Matt Simmons is Brittany's husband, and I called him on Friday to see if I could use this story. So I was thinking about integrity and just examples of that word, integrity. And there's a bunch I've heard, and and, uh, we could all probably share different stories we have that are similar to this one, but I was stalking him on Instagram because he commented on your post about Mercy Village Church. And so he seemed interested. So I was like, who's this guy that's interested? Birdie, whatever this weird name is. And then I recognized him, uh, that it was Matt's dad. But as I was scrolling through his feed, he had taken this picture, this letter that he'd gotten, and he'd shared a little bit of the backstory. And Matt gave me his phone number, and I just got busy and never did call him. I was going to try to get some more details about the story, but he was preparing to go to Mexico, and he lost his wallet in California. And uh, so he's kind of canceling all the cards and stuff, but he had a bunch of cash in there, I think like four or $500. And, you know, all that identification stuff, it's like just a hassle. So he gets back from Mexico, and, and in his mailbox is his wallet with everything still in it, and then there's this letter, and I thought the letter was funny. Just that somebody took the time to actually, because, you know, you would just, like, put a card in there normally and be like, hey, found this, you know, here it is. Or you just keep it for yourself. But this person says, dear Mr. Simmons, it appears your wallet decided to make what I can only assume was an unscheduled trip to California, period. And then it's, like, spaced down. I gave it a stern talking to concerning its apparent lack of preparedness concerning COVID-19 precautions. And I'm returning it to you, period, and another space. I wish you both continued good health and happiness. So anything that personifies like animals or inanimate objects, I'm really a big fan of. Um, So I found that funny. But the point is, right, that's like a really small example, but that's a big thing. That's rare. You don't see that all the time. Most people find a wallet. It's got cash in it. They might take, even if they give the wallet back, they're like going to keep the cash or, you know, like that sort of thing. But that's just a small, small example of integrity. I call that humorous integrity because it came with a funny letter. But today in Matthew chapter 1, we're going to learn about compassionate integrity. That when mercy draws near, it gives birth to compassionate integrity. We're in a small series of just three sermons, but they're uh, in this Advent season. And as we go through them, uh, we're seeing different people who were impacted by Advent. Last week, we looked at Mary. Last week, we saw the power of mercy transforming Mary's life. And what we called last week was when mercy draws near, it gives birth to humble participation. She says, let it be to me according to your will. Well, this week, Joseph gets his birth announcement. And we'll see that with Joseph's birth announcement, when mercy draws near, it gives birth to compassionate integrity. When we begin to know who God is and what he's done on our behalf, when we we begin to know that as a result of who he is and what he's done, that we've been changed into new people. Right? Like when we understand the, the, the results of mercy drawing near in the transformation of our very lives, we're moved to grow in integrity and to grow in compassion. And so my prayer today is that both of those things will mark us. Compassion and integrity. We'll get into what, what those kind of look like in Joseph's life but that both of those things will be marks of us as we behold this Advent season, as we're reminded of the mercy of God at work in our lives. 
that like Joseph, we would bask in the mercy of God, that we wouldn't miss that in this season. And as we bask in the mercy of God, we would grow in compassion and integrity. Will you pray for, pray with me? God, thank you for your people here this morning. They could be anywhere else, but we're here together. And I believe that there's a word from you to be heard today from your word. I pray that it not be mine. I pray that I will hide my face behind your word. It'll be your word that is is spoken and seen as glorious today. That it'll be you who is seen as beautiful today. That it'll be Jesus who is seen as worthy today. And so into that end, what we know not, please teach us. And what we are not, please make us. And what we have not, please give us. So in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So last week, if you're familiar with the timeline, we saw Mary's announcement. Now, if you're not familiar with the timeline, she gets the first birth announcement. So imagine if you decided to strategically send out your birth announcements like one at a time when the baby's on the way. Now, with Joseph's, though, he waits three months to get his. There's three months between Mary's announcement and his announcement. And what's happened is that when Mary gets her birth announcement and her life is literally changing in the most dramatic fashion that any of us could could ever imagine, she then packs everything up and goes 60 miles away from Nazareth to Judah to be with her cousin Elizabeth. Elizabeth is six months pregnant with John the Baptist. So I guess it just runs in the family. You have a bunch of great ministers of the gospel in the family. So she goes and visits there. Now, they didn't have FaceTime, right? So she's not like calling Joe up every day. And he can see her face and see how earnest she is and see the change that's happening in her life. No. No phones, no anything. I mean, maybe there's some rumors that are passed around from person to person within the family, like like he hears because that she's doing all right from somebody else that's in in the family, but he doesn't know. And when she gets back, she's got a baby bump. It's not a food baby. It's an actual real-life baby in her belly. And here's how it goes for Joseph. Now the birth of, this is Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place. Oh yeah, we have this, I forgot. Look at that. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And so Mary claims to have been touched by an angel. That this is how the pregnancy came about. Now, what we miss so often, because we've read this so many times, we've heard these stories, these recountings of these events so many times, is that this is happening in real time for Joseph. He's not celebrated this every December since he was a baby. This is happening to him In real time. And so for Joseph, as we'll find out, he doesn't bite. Not completely. He's not 100% convinced of the story yet. You'll see that in a couple verses here. So just like last week, though, get into the situation. Like, slow down. Get into it. A couple things will help you get there. Nazareth was a military outpost type of town. So you got a bunch of single dudes there or guys that are away from their families there. Not all of them under the complete control of the Holy Ghost. Not all of them brought up morally and upstandingly. And so they're probably on the weekends roaming around, liquored up, doing what red-blooded Nazarites do when they're liquored up on the weekends. And so there were probably more than a few 
unexpected pregnancies in Nazareth. It probably wasn't the only one that had ever happened. So there's that piece. Mary left suddenly and she's been gone. They haven't got to talk about this. If you've ever been in a situation in your marriage where you've been separated from each other for an extended period of time, it pays a, t- it pays a toll. There's distance that grows in the distance. So that's happening. Maybe she tried to tell him before she left. I think she did. But we don't have that as a guarantee that she did. But even if she had, he has to sit with that news for three months. He can't process it with her. And when he gets back, when she gets back, he sees it is a distinct reality. Right? He knows for sure that even if she had told him before, it's, it's real. Not only that, but what makes this more intense is that she's betrothed to Joseph. This isn't just some crush that he's got. This isn't just some girlfriend and, and he feels maybe betrayed by this woman who he really liked. They're betrothed. We don't do that anymore. But what that would have been was like a really official engagement. You would have had to write a, uh, a divorce paperwork and issued it to get out of this engagement or this betrothal. So it was legally binding betrothal. It was emotionally and spiritually binding. And it had every component to it except for the physical component. Which, by the way, I sound like an old curmudgeon, but we do it the opposite now in this world. We do all the physical stuff first, and then we decide whether we want to make those promises to each other. But Mary and Joseph did it the opposite way. So she's in contract. She's in covenant. She is promised to Joseph. And intimacy with anyone during this betrothal period, even her betrothed, would have been considered adultery. Adultery for Joseph and adultery for Mary. And what you don't think about, and, and in this day it wasn't, it wasn't very common at all, but it wasn't impossible that Mary could have been stoned to death for this. It was within the law for her to be stoned to death for committing adultery during her betrothal period. That's wild. Now, again, by this time, right, as culture progressed, it wasn't the common thing. But you think about, like, the way we sentence people. There's maximum sentences and minimum sentences, and the maximum sentence allowed for Mary if she was convicted of adultery was death. And so that's the situation. So Joseph is caught flat-footed by this. And here he is having to respond. We've been there, not this exact scenario, but we've been there where situations get a little bit out of control, out of our control, where unexpected things happen. Maybe we feel betrayed by someone and they tell us they meant it differently or that the situation's different than how we're reading it. But you feel that pain inside of you that comes with betrayal. Now, you and I know it wasn't real betrayal. But that's how Joseph was reading it. He could only see it through his own eyes right now. He hadn't got his birth announcement yet. And so he tries to make a decision. How's he going to respond? How would you have responded? I would have been really passive aggressive. I would have been really mean. I would have been really harsh. I would have been guilt tripping Mary up one side and down the other. And the other thing I'd have been trying to do is make sure that nobody knows or nobody thinks that I'm guilty. I want this to all be on her. I don't want people whispering in the streets that Joseph's adulterous. They need to know it's Mary's fault. But Joseph's a better man than me. Verse 19, we read his response. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. Now, he had that right to do that in this betrothal period in the wake of what he would have considered in the moment to be adultery. So 
you have this man and he could have made a scene out of this. Like I said, I would have wanted to. I don't want it to justify my own name. I don't want it to, to let everyone know that I was in the right. He could have requested the maximum sentence, or he certainly could have divorced her in a very public and boisterous way. But when just when justice and compassion walk hand in hand, the response is different. There's two things that verse tells us about Joseph. He was a just man and he was a compassionate man. He wanted to do the right thing, but he wanted to do the right thing in the way that was the most compassionate way possible. His eyes, she'd been unfaithful, but he couldn't just throw her under the bus. He couldn't just cast her off in a way that, that put her to shame. Listen to me, if you're committed to justice today, it has to come with compassion if it's going to look like biblical justice. But the, the, the vice versa is true as well. If you're committed to compassion today, it must come with justice. Neither one of those can fall. They both have to happen. They both belong, justice and compassion. We tend to be one way or the other as humans. Move to compassion maybe to the point where we forget about justice and we maybe enable or let people get away with things. Or so committed to justice that we come in like a bull in a china shop and just break everything in our path. Joseph is, and, and, and get in his shoes, he is wrestling. I can see him up at night wrestling with how can compassion and justice coincide in this situation, knowing what he knows. And so he wrestles with it and he comes up with his plan. And his plan was to divorce her quietly. Led by compassion and justice, he finds the best way that he can. What he'll do is give her the, he's going to take the minimum sentence way out. He's going to get two people. That was all that was required. He'll probably find people that he knows will keep their mouth shut. He'll bring them in. They'll witness the divorce. And then maybe Mary can run off again to Elizabeth's house, away from all the local gossip, and have the baby there. And Joseph also gets to do the right thing, though. She's been unfaithful to him, and he could divorce her. This is his response of compassion to the situation as he sees it. But as you and I already know, he doesn't see it completely. He doesn't see the situation as it is, but for him to see it as it is, it will have to be revealed to him. And that happens in verse 20. But as he considered these things, that word is so gentle, considered. As he wrestled with these things, as he churned over these things. Verse 20. See, this is new. That was 19. Quick, read it. There's 20. All right. And I'll get there. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Three things that you get there. Number one headline is, hey, Mary was right. Every man hates to hear that. But it was true. Mary's right. Mary ain't lying. The Holy Ghost put that baby inside of her. She's never been touched by another man. She didn't make this up. It's for real. Number two, he gives a prophecy supporting reminder. He reminds David of, uh, or he reminds Joseph of his family heritage in David. He says to him, son of David, you're from the royal line. Don't forget Maybe Joseph thinks back to 2 Samuel 7, verse 16, where God makes this promise to David. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me, David. Your throne shall be established forever, David. And then, a little bit later, the kingdom splits. 
And there's only two little tribes that stay with David's family. And king after king reigns, but then comes exile. And the throne is literally broken down. And then they come back from exile. And now at this point, they're ruled by the Romans. A child of David has not sat on the throne in a long time, let alone give it, given anybody the impression that the kingdom of David, that the throne of David would be established forever. And the angel of the Lord reminds Joseph, I'm about to keep the promise. I'm about to establish the forever king on the throne of David. His name will be Jesus. The third thing that we see is the same thing he said to Mary. Don't be afraid. And if you read between the lines like we did with Mary last week, the obvious part is this ain't going to be easy, Joseph. People are going to whisper. People are going to talk. People aren't going to see it. I'm not visiting the whole town, Joseph. Everybody's not getting this angel delivered birth announcement. They're going to be left to draw their own conclusions. And it'll play out like that. Scripture revealed. It's coming. He says, don't be afraid. And in verse 21, he says this. The angel of the Lord continues, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. That's Advent. That mercy would draw near. That Jesus, God, the son would put skin on, dwell with us and become the sacrifice to end all sacrifices that through faith. In the finished work of Jesus on the cross, we who call ourselves Christians could be saved from our sins. That's Advent. So much for a a gender reveal ultrasound, by the way, too. They don't get to have any special party where they open the box and the blue balloons go flowing out. He says, it's a boy, by the way. Sorry. (laughs) You just got to know. And his name. Is Jesus. Yahshua. Joshua. Common name. Super common name. But this baby's far from common, as we just said. He will save his people from their sins. The scribes, the Pharisees and scribes later, they'll be in a confrontation with Jesus. Jesus, this man will be dropped through the seal, uh, the roof. Remember, they ripped the, the shingles off a roof and they dropped this paralyzed man down in front of Jesus. And Jesus, Tells him, take up your bed and and walk. And the man stands up and he says to him that his faith, right, has made him whole. But then he says something else. He says, your sins are forgiven. And the Pharisees and the scribes get all jacked up about this because who can forgive sins but God? They're quoting Isaiah when they say that. They're quoting the psalmist when they say it. Who can forgive sins but God? Bingo. That's exactly who can forgive sins. And that's exactly who this man is. God in the flesh. This is the incarnation. Fully God, fully man, Jesus with us. Verse 22 and 23. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. He quotes Isaiah. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel. Look how terrible I am. I'm going to give up, guys. This is so bad. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Mercy is drawing near. It's coming close for the people of God. Mercy is drawing near to Mary. Mercy is drawing near to... To Joseph, and today we are reminded that mercy is drawing near to us. To us, children of God. Four huge takeaways already. Two sermons in. We've seen this in both sermons. We'll see it again next, uh, or on Christmas Eve. Four takeaways from Advent. We're going we're gonna to say them now. One, Advent is good news for the losers. 
Advent is good news for the losers. We talked about how Mary's from Nazareth, right? Nothing special. She's a young woman. She wasn't royal blood. She wasn't, you know, of some, you know, special family or huge level of wealth. Joseph's just a carpenter's boy. Advent is good news for the losers, people from Nazareth, carpenters, young mothers, people who get whispered about in the streets, the poor, the marginalized, the weak, and sinners like you and sinners like me. Advent is good news for me, and Advent is good news for you. Advent is a loving call to fear not. Advent is a loving call into your life today to fear not. He says that to Mary. He says that to Joseph. And and hear me, tone matters, by the way. Some of us, our, our parental units have jacked up our understanding of who God is. And so when we hear the angel come and say, fear not, we hear like, suck it up, buttercup. We hear, don't be a scaredy cat. This is the voice of a loving father holding his children close and saying, fear not. I am with you. I am with you. Are you scared today, churning about something? You got uncertainty about some things in your life? Don't be afraid. Hear God speaking in the Advent season. He's got this. Number three, Advent is evidence that God does the impossible. He reminds Mary of this, that nothing will be impossible for God. That's a direct quote. And then he confirms with Joseph that the impossible is coming true. He makes barren wombs bear children. And he makes barren places in our lives spring forth life. He takes hearts of stone and turns them into hearts of flesh. Advent is evidence that God does the impossible. So what's impossible right now for you? Is it impossible for your marriage to thrive? Is it impossible for your job to be something you delight in? Is it impossible for you to overcome that certain sin in your life? Is it impossible for that thing you're waiting for to come about? God whispers in Advent that he does impossible things. And lastly, number four, Advent is a reminder that God keeps his promises. God keeps his promises today. The promises of God through Isaiah both get cited to Mary and Joseph. Hear me today. God keeps his promises. He keeps them. Every last one of them. His promise to be with you. He keeps that promise child of God. That promise that there's no condemnation for you in Christ. He keeps that promise. That promise to care for you and keep you. Even when you feel like you're losing, even when you feel like you're afraid, even when you feel like it's impossible, God keeps his promises. So we close with this, Joseph's response. Notice... That's right. It was a lot like that, actually. That was the exact response. And he, he, he ran away screaming and said, screw this, not happening. <laughs> that is not how the story goes. We did this last week with Mary. We talked about who God is the whole stinking time because that's the most important thing. But don't miss the human response because it matters too. It follows in the wake of who God is and what God's done. But it matters. And so Joseph responds in verses 24 and 25. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. When mercy draws near, it gives birth to compassionate integrity And compassionate integrity was what Joseph shows. Like Mary, Joseph knew the cost of obedience. 
He did. He knew he was going to be whispered about in the streets. They're going to call him the carpenter's son. Jesus will be called that. You know what that means? There ain't a single person in that town. Not a single one. The vast majority of the people in that town aren't buying the story. They don't believe it. That ain't the Holy Spirit's boy. That's the carpenter's boy. Which means that he was in the wrong. He did nothing. He waited. I have it written in my Bible here. Uh, sexual purity. What a man. And then I have that little smiley face that my wife doesn't let me draw anymore because it's really corny, which means I wrote this before I met my wife. That's how old this Bible is, if you couldn't tell from the duct tape. So I was probably really struggling with that at the time, and I just was really in awe of Joseph. He keeps himself pure. And he obeys. He goes to the end. And he doesn't get any credit for it, not in that life. He gets credit for it now, but he never saw it. He never experienced it. You see, integrity isn't showmanship. Integrity happens in the quiet places, behind closed doors, oftentimes when nobody's watching, doing the right thing the first time, every time. When mercy draws near, it gives us lives of compassion and integrity. Because the true child of God understands that the only version of history that matters is the one God writes. And even though the village of Nazareth is going to write a different story in their minds, while the baby Jesus is growing up to become a man, God's writing a completely different one. And that's beautiful. So mercy draws near. His name's Jesus. Jesus does better than Joseph. Jesus doesn't just have integrity. Jesus has perfect integrity. Never sins. Hebrews 4 says he was tempted in every way, but without sin. But just like Joseph, Jesus was a just man. And Jesus knew that sin had to be punished. Matthew will speak of Jesus in chapter 9. Just like Joseph... He was a man who was moved with compassion. And Jesus moved with compassion would reconcile justice and compassion, integrity and compassion on the cross. When the Son of God with perfect integrity would be crucified on our behalf. Because Joseph does one thing, or Jesus does one thing better than Joseph. You see, Joseph... He was compassionate and just, but he couldn't justify Mary. He couldn't. He couldn't make her right before God. He couldn't take away her sins. He couldn't pardon her. He couldn't forgive her. All he could do was be a man of justice and compassion, but he could not justify. But if you go to Romans chapter 3, and you look at verses 21 through 26, you read this. And now the righteousness of God has been manifest apart from the law. So the law couldn't save, although the law and the prophets bore witness to it. So the law pointed to the fact that Jesus was coming, that he would be here. It wasn't enough to save us, but it was enough to show us who, what Jesus looked like when he got here. So we'd recognize him and say, thank God you're here because the law ain't cutting it. We need mercy. We need grace. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's the bad news. Every one of us separated from God by our sins. Verse 24. But are, we are and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as the propitiation the atonement, the appeasement of the wrath of God by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. Verse 26, it was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. 
See, Joseph's a great man. But he wasn't Jesus. Jesus, the Son of God, would die in our place so that we could be justified before God. You see, Mary's sin wasn't actually a sin. Joseph thought it was, but it wasn't. She'd been upright in that in that way. But our sin's for real. Mine is. And I need justified. I need redemption and forgiveness. So trust Jesus today if you're not a Christian. Jesus died on the cross in your place. Put your faith and trust in him and be saved. And for those of us who are in Christ, might we be moved by compassion? Number one. In our relationships, at work, sports, at home, as husbands, as fathers, as wives and mothers, as bosses or as employees, even as we scroll through our social media, when nobody even has to see whether we're being compassionate or not, and we think all these thoughts in our head about how dumb that person is or how idiotic this person is, might we instead be moved with compassion? And might we be marked by integrity? Might being a Christian mean being righteous, doing the right thing the first time, every time? And we won't be people who cut corners at work. We won't be people who talk out of both sides of our mouth. We won't be people who hold on to our private sins, but on the outside maybe look like we're godly and following after Jesus. And then lastly, may this be because we're captured by the mercy of God. If we're to be people of integrity, if we're to be people of compassion, we must be captured by the mercy of God. So put yourself in position to receive the mercy of God. Read the word, listen to whatever podcasts, music, all those things. Just intake, ingest it, hear it, receive it. Recite it, speak it to others, and remember the gospel. And pray that God will reveal his mercy afresh in this season and in all the seasons to come. When mercy draws near, it gives birth to compassionate integrity. I can't make myself... A compassionate person or a person of integrity. And neither can you. But I deeply long for us to be marked by those two things. As Mercy Village Church and just as individuals, that will be marked by that. Father, make us that way. I, I can't preach us into that. I can't hardly talk through a mask. I can't even remember to change the slides. But you're capable of transforming lives. So transform mine and transform the lives of those in this room that we would be moved with compassion towards others, love for others. And we'd be people of of integrity. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Thanks for listening, and if you haven't already, we would love for you to join the work of God as Jesus builds Mercy Village Church. You can learn more at our website at www.mercyvillage.church.